All right, clap your hands. God bless you today. Somebody shout hallelujah if you love the Lord. All right, have your seats. Have your seats in the presence of the Lord. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Listen, if there's an empty seat next to you, I'm going to invite you to move towards the center aisle, please, towards the center aisle. So folks that are still arriving don't have to come down the middle aisle and make a grand entrance, nor do they have to step on your shoes. Amen. Amen. Don't be afraid. The person sitting next to you is about as jacked up as you are, praise God. So if anything else, the closer you get, y'all will raise each other's value. I wish I had a church today. Amen. All right. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him thank you for sitting next to me today. Thank you for sitting next to me today. Hallelujah. We're so blessed and glad to have all of you in the house of the Lord one more time. If you're glad to be alive, come on, let's clap our hands and let's thank the Lord. Let's thank the Lord. Let's thank the Lord. What a blessing it is to experience one more day, uh, one more day to be alive. And certainly uh, on behalf of myself and uh, our ministry team, remember uh, Lady Cherie, she is sick. She went home sick, man, wore herself out at our leadership retreat. Amen. And, and I think my little baby had the EBGBs and she was doing too much kissing on the sick baby. Amen. I was trying to tell him, you keep them kids away from me now. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> no, we were, I, I just, we just pray, pray for Lady Sharice, amen. She's going to need to recover, amen. Uh, but certainly uh, on behalf of her and uh, Pastor Tanisha and, and Minister Wayne, and, and of course we got Pastor Donna in the house, everybody, amen. And all of the leaders, we just want to say thank God for you being here, and we hope that you already feel welcome. To all those watching on Facebook Live, we want to celebrate them as well. Let's thank God for our Facebook Live audience. I want to invite you right quick, take out your cell phones, and let's invite someone to join in with us on worship. We're going to have a quick panel conversation about uh, the impact of Dr. Martin Luther King's holiday uh, on our lives. And we're going to uh, invite some of our loved ones in the congregation from the African diaspora, including Haiti, is going to join us on stage to help give us a little bit of context on some of the experiences that our Haitian brothers and sisters and loved ones have. And so we're going to have a good little conversation as well as hear a great sermon from Pastor Don. And so uh, this is a good opportunity to take a few moments while we do our announcements and invite someone to join us. Uh, go to your Facebook page and uh, put the Way Christian Center's link on your Facebook page, Facebook page. And let's have a good time inviting those to join us in worship this morning. We have uh, some announcements, so why don't we turn our attention to the screen and see what the announcements are for this week. And then we'll come back and have a little conversation about what it means to live out this legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Good morning, here are your announcements. Walk with Christ and be baptized. Sign up on a connection card or at thewayberkeley.com slash connect. Be prepared to attend the baptism class which happens on the day you're baptized. We commit to helping you grow as a Christian. Sign up for the available live groups at thewayberkeley.com slash grow. Groups include UC Berkeley small groups too. Check the website for the schedule. Get a free session with a licensed clinician by signing up at thewayberkeley.com. Join us for Soul Speak Open Mic Night. It's your time to give a hopeful voice to the struggles and triumph related to depression and suicide. The event is filled with spoken word and music and is on Saturday, January 20th at 6.30 p.m. Our church members, Michael, Sarah, and their friend, Teresa, are teaming up for some real talk about how being Black, Asian American, and white respectively influences their friendship and their participation in the body of Christ. They'll be doing so on stage with original music, prose, and worship. The event is scheduled for Tuesday, January 23rd at 7 p.m. at the First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley. You can get your tickets at Eventbrite. Join your friends who have expanded their service to our community. You can serve for a term on one of our ministry teams. Sign up at thewayberkeley.com slash grow in order to serve. You can access these updates and more at thewayberkeley.com. Enjoy your week. Good morning, everyone. How you doing? Everyone say this Saturday. Tell your neighbor this Saturday. Tell the other one that you ignored. This Saturday. It's going down. I want to invite up a friend of mine. Her name is Jamie. Jamie, could you come up? She is one of the founders of uh, what we're doing, our Soul Speak Night. It's going to be amazing. I'm going to let you, let you hear firsthand about the incredible things in store. 
Thank you. Hi, my name is Jamie, and um, I am one of the people putting on the event um, Soul Speak on this Saturday. This is our second event, um, and basically we wanted to um, bring something to the church that um, allows people the opportunity to tell their story about depression, suicide, and um, any type of mental health, um, because we find that that's happening a lot in our community and nobody's really talking about it. Nobody wants to really address it. Um, people who go through it, they go through it on their own and they don't feel comfortable sharing. And, um, you know, we, we think that in church that should be a safe space for people to be able to um, share those things and find, find some help and find some support. And um, that's not always the case, unfortunately. And so we wanted to create this space. It's, um, it's, all ages um, and um, it will be people just sharing their story in different creative ways so spoken word or if you just want to get up and just talk re normally um, and tell your testimony there's some um, dancing um, so just different things and um, we'll definitely be having some prayer that's uh, one of the main things we want to make sure we do and um, just go to God and just really go after um, healing and wholeness in the name of Jesus. And so um, we're excited and we, we really thank you guys for uh, allowing us to come in and be in your church. We thank you, uh, Pastor McBride, uh, for opening the doors for us. And so uh, hopefully you all are able to come out and be a part and, and just... Uh, you know, if someone wants to be uh, a part of it and wants to share, we will have a sign up for people to be able to uh, share. We also have already had people signing up a whole lot. And so um, if there's a whole lot of people, we may not be able to get to everybody, but we want to uh, just open that up for people to be able to share their, t their testimonies. Um, the program starts at 630 on this Saturday. And it's free. So bring someone, bring a loved one, someone you think could use some healing. We want to see you this Saturday. Thank you. All right. Any spoken word artists in the house? Anybody that got a little spoken word want to come up and audition real quick? Sign up. Oh, oh, oh no, 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 no. All right. Well, come on on Saturday. <laughs> this is real quick. Come on up on Saturday and uh, let's have a good time. Let's definitely uh, allow this space to be a space where healing can happen. Um, through the testimonies and the stories that we tell in art, it'll be a great, great opportunity. Um, how many of you are um, aware of the, the, the ways that Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy has certainly been both celebrated but also co-opted? Amen. By, uh, by our many forces in our country, uh, both on uh, either side of the political spectrum, uh, I think it's always important to just appreciate that Martin Luther King Jr., uh, by his own kind of self-declaration and testimony, called himself a preacher. He said, I'm a Baptist preacher. My uh, father is a Baptist preacher. My great, my grandfather is a Baptist preacher. He said, all that I have done, I have attempted to serve the church and bring glory to God. And, and it is that kind of powerful legacy of serving a God and God's church that has spilled over into blessing and uh, really providing healing and direction for the world. And this week I was invited to speak on the uh, uh, U.S. Coast Guard Alameda base. Amen. And uh, you know, one of the, one of the one of the one of the comrades, uh, Rosa Clemente in New York, uh, recommended me to her her friend who's a, in the U.S. Coast Guard. And so, you know, it was my first time actually on a military base and certainly my first time speaking uh, on a military base. And so it was fascinating because, you know, you know, I, I, I was thinking to myself now, what can I say on a military base about Martin Luther King Jr. that wouldn't make these folk throw me in the brig? Praise God. And so, you know, I, I try to do what I do and, you know, mix in a little humor, but also, you know, give them a couple uppercuts, amen, uh, of, of, of truth, praise God, and then a little more humor, and then a few more uppercuts. And, 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 and uh, by the end, I, 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 I think I was able to help communicate that Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy and certainly his words, if you read all of them, not just what he spoke at the, the last half of his speech in uh, the March on Washington, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. seems like he's writing to us today almost as if he wrote it yesterday. 
and uh, he talked a lot about dehumanization and and uh, degradation and nullification and all these great big words that we actually find to be um, being executed in our larger culture. And so I thought it'd be good for us uh, to, to bring some of the voices of our congregation uh, on stage and help us make sense a little bit of some of what we've been hearing this week. I'm sure many of us uh, uh, watched and heard with horror as uh, our, our, our uh, um, chief political leader, uh, 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 well, Donald Trump, I'm trying to figure out how to, how, to, how to say his name without saying other names, praise God, uh, made such disparaging comments about uh, many of our countries from the diaspora and from uh, um, South America. And so uh, we have some folks in our congregation who actually hail from these countries. And I thought it'd be great to have uh, someone from uh, Haiti come on stage uh, or, and uh, give us some, some of their own experience and testimony about uh, the beautiful country of Haiti that many of us have had a chance to visit and support. Um, and so put your hands together for Sister Cassandra Baptiste as she comes. I know I saw her. Cassandra, Cassandra. Where, where you? She went to, oh, yes, yeah, I'm sorry. What am I saying? I'm messing it all up. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, sit, sit down. Then I, I, read, I read the wrong name. And then I'm going to have t uh, Sister Tiffany Johnson. That, that's your name, right? <laughs> Tiffany. Come on. <laughs> Tiffany Johnson, sort of kind of, is going to come and join us as well on stage. Alexandra, Lord, Cassandra, Alexandra, I'm just a tired black man. Amen. Uh, all right, so why don't, why don't you all both go ahead and just give us a quick introduction of who you are and what do you do now, and, and then I'll, I'll uh, give us an opportunity to a answer and ask a couple questions. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Alexandra Bastien. Um, <laughs> um, I, I know her. I promise I do. I don't know. <laughs> I am, I am Haitian American. Um, my family immigrated from Haiti in the 1970s. Um, and I am from Boston, go Celtics. And uh, <laughs> live here in Oakland fight. now. <laughs> um, and I work at, um, I think an organization many of you are familiar with, I work at Policy Link. A couple of my colleagues are also attend church here. So happy to be here. And thank you, Pastor Mike, for reaching out. Clap your hands, everybody, for Alexandra. God bless you. Good morning, I'm Tiffany. I'm black. <laughs> uh, born and raised in Bayview Hunters Point, and I'm an educator. Thank you for having me this morning. All right, clap it up for the, her. And, all right. So obviously, there uh, has been a lot of conversations around Haiti and uh, some of our countries in Africa and uh, certainly some of our countries in South America around immigration and, and all of this was emerging out of a conversation around immigration. Um, I'd love to just kind of hone in a little bit on Haiti and have you tell us a little bit of the journey and the story of your family. Um, and just starting off, and then I'd I love to, to, to ask you a couple other questions that um, may be a little bit relevant for us. But just tell us your story and your journey. Sure. So um, I feel like really I'm telling my, my mother's story. Um, she left Haiti in 1973, just after um, Jean-Claude Duvalier Jr., baby doc, took over as the dictator of the nation. Um, and so even though the economy was actually slightly better than um, the kind of political leadership was very unsafe and harmful, and if you said anything, any kind of critique about um, the president at the time, the dictator at the time, then there was a very high likelihood that um, the makuts, which um, translates to like the boogeymen, basically the president's um, armed personal um, bullies <laughs> would come after you. Um, and that did happen to my uncle, her brother-in-law. And so the family, my family was leaving um, on both sides. Uh, my mom's from Port-au-Prince. She came to America in 1973. 
worked in factories, lived undocumented for a while, but by the time I was born in, in the 86, um, she was a citizen. Um, so I think she's had the kind of a, a um, I, I feel like the experience is not the same for all people. Some people live many, many, many years um, undocumented and worried about issues like this. Um, TPS, temporary protected status, um, was something that was developed for Haitians after the earthquake. I think yesterday was the anniversary. Um, my brain yeah. is forgetting what the date Eight is. Eight years, I think, yes. was on um, Thursday. Yes, in 2010. Though. This mm -hmm. week was the anniversary of the devastating earthquake in Haiti. It was like a seven point to earthquake that destroyed a lot of infrastructure, um, displaced hundreds of thousands, um, and many Haitians were welcomed into the United States, especially on the East Coast, especially in Massachusetts, where I'm from. Um, and they were offered temporary protective status because not only was there the earthquake that displaced them, but within a year there was a major cholera outbreak that f displaced even more um, Haitian families. Mm -hmm. So these issues like TPS being taken away um, only incite fear for folks who may not even be, may not even have that level of documentation. Um, and so, you know, a lot of families, just like you're seeing here as, as um, sanctuary cities are kind of being targeted, um, families are afraid to send their kids to school. My mom works in the school system. You know, she has parents calling her nonstop because she's kind of like the Haitian <laughs> on deck <laughs> mm. to respond to a lot of um, questions. So, um, and, and, and in particular in the school district where my mother works, the Brockton Public School District, um, they welcome many, many Haitian children into the school system after the earthquake. So they are particularly um, um, vulnerable. <laughs> So I think it's just really a, a fear tactic, um, that's the way I see it, um, to make folks not feel that they can fight back against this administration anyway, to be afraid to, um, to be afraid to be known, to be public, to say anything. Um, I think it, it's interesting because it's like that was the problem under baby doc <laughs> and here we are with Donald Trump. Um, so I, I'll stop there. I, I heard a, I heard a, a fascinating um, account of how Baby Doc, um, who uh, was sustained by um, I think the United States government, uh, largely funded, and mm -hmm. and how Baby Doc uh, was actually laundering his money through the Trump um, Tower administration, like many of these dictators would would take money and buy condos from Donald Trump as a way to launder their money. Mm -hmm. Um, and that there was just a level of corruption and complicity yeah. with the United States government and Haiti and many European countries for at least a hundred plus years yes. because Haiti was one of the first countries that actually had a slave revolt. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if you know any of that history that you can just share a little succinctly, but sure. I think it's really important to make some connections between yeah. why Haiti continues to be an easy target mm -hmm. for such disparaging comments yeah. because many of us just don't know some history. So, yeah, so um, on January 1st, if you all have Haitian friends on your, on your Facebook feeds, you might have seen a lot of us having um, a special soup called Soup Jumo. Um, it's like a squash soup. Um, January 1st is Haitian Independence Day. Um, after, it is a celebration of the successful slave revolt of 1804. Yes. Um, <laughs> Um, where Toussaint Louverture helped um, lead slaves to take over the citadel, which is um, a large fortress that was built um, to protect the slave owners and was, you know, a large castle. It's a beautiful place if you ever have an opportunity to visit. Um, and when the slaves, um, this, the reason I brought up the soup is because the story is that this soup was a soup that the slaves had to make for their masters every Sunday. Um, and the story is that after the slaves took over the citadel, um, they sat down together and ate soup jumo. So you'll, he you'll hear every year us uh, celebrating the soup. Um, it's a very big significance. Um, we gotta so add that, that. We gotta add that to our gumbo <laughs> and stuff. Now we're gonna eat yeah, some, some, some let's call soup ju 
Soup Jumo. Jumo. Yeah. All right. Everybody say Jumo. Amen. <laughs> Add that to your black eyed peas yeah. and greens on the <laughs> next year. <laughs> so, so um, the, I'll try to make this quick. Um, this the the Haitian Revolution um, is still paying the penalty today of mm. taking the lead. Wow. Um, Haitians had the audacity to say enough is enough, and we're not asking for our liberation, we're taking it. Yes. Um, yes. And since then, um, the French have, um, they destroyed infrastructure on their way out, um, and they have kept, um, they've made sure to keep Haiti under its thumb um, and colluded with other governments around the world, especially the United States, to ensure that Haiti has never had the economic freedom um, and social freedom that it it would sig it signifies, right? Um, so there have been many times. There's a lot I could say. I don't want to take too long, but um, the United States government has played a significant role in making sure that tr Haiti doesn't have a truly popular democracy. Mm. So there we had um, Ali Steed, who was the president after, um, after Baby Doc was um, also revolted against. And he was a priest and ran yeah, a large... Exactly. He was um, a priest. He built an incredible coalition of the people. Um, and he was um, overwhelmingly popularly voted into office. Um, and... America was not happy with that. He was too popular. So he was removed from office twice. Um, first by um, George Bush, the first one, <laughs> and then again by Bill Clinton. Um, and so... Uh, and let, let's just pause right there. This, yeah. When I went, we, went, we took it, how many of y'all remember, you, okay, many of you may not have been here long enough, but right after 2008, earthquake, we took a delegation from the way to Haiti, and myself, Antonio, Asha, how many were here for that? Because we raised a lot of money, and we launched some schools in Haiti with the blessing of some of the young people who were in Aristide's mm -hmm. orphanage. Mm -hmm. um, they called themselves Patriots, mm -hmm. and, and it was so fascinating because they told us these stories, and Randall Robinson and Maxine Waters have a ton of work. If you just Google them, they'll tell you how Maxine Waters and Randall Robinson had to fly to an African country where the U.S. forces dropped Aristide off mm -hmm. um, to get him asylum, I think, in France? Yes. And so this is a bipartisan yes. and a legacy of, of um, degradation against the country of Haiti that was rubbed in our faces by the terrible, not only continuous policies of our country, by revoking TPS and all these other things, but also by the rhetoric of Donald Trump. And so why is this important for us? Because again, as followers of Jesus, I want to suggest that we are on the clock in this Trump administration because for good or for bad, we are being caricatured as the support system uh, morally and even numerically for this president. And I know uh, a lot of that support system may be couched in the evangelical church, but until God says otherwise, they are still a part of the same church we are a part of. And we have to, I think, be just as vocal about our prophetic and historical recounting of this history so we don't participate in a reenactment of that um, through legalized genocide, um, legalized exclusion of people from our country. And I think it is so important for us to take time to talk about that. I'm gonna come back to you before we leave, just to give a final word, but I wanna bring in um, Tiffany Johnson because Tiffany's work um, is, uh, has a long legacy of, of not only organizing activism, but talk a little bit about this um, Martin Luther King Jr. holiday and, and what do you think is required for us in this season to make sure we're being faithful to King and to all of these opportunities to uh, be faithful um, to justice and liberation. So I, I think in all of what we're talking about, to be honest, I'm looking right in the front row, the shirt, People Against Colonialism, I had that same shirt on yesterday. Uh, to be honest, we're talking about resistance to colonial efforts. And whether it's in this story or, or particularly black folk in the US brought here to carry out the colonial project, we have an estranged relationship with religion. 
And many of the folks in the crowd today are probably here because they're trying to reconcile what that means to be an activist and be in the church on Sunday, given our history with colonization. Um, and what's powerful about thinking about King and where he comes from is he comes from a legacy where we start to make sense of that, mm. where you have folks who are riding up hard against colonialism. You have Nat Turner, you have black folks in the US who are rising up against it, using our tradition of faith as a way to justify that. And King comes in and follows in that tradition, right? And for many of us, we've learned a very convenient narrative about King. It made sense and it actually was able to be taken by our oppressors and used to justify pacifism and for us to sit down. But upon his death, unfortunately, we learned that he was a very inconvenient hero yes. when we actually learn what he spoke about, what he actually was preaching about in meaningful ways. And right, we talk about the three evils that King pushed for um, and pushed us to start to think about and ultimately what he died for. Mm -hmm. And we learn particularly- What are those evils? I'm, I'm gonna get there. Oh, okay. We get there. He's getting, he's getting excited. I thought you was running by him. I just want no, to not at make all. a pit stop, praise God. Not but at I, all. I'll be quiet and let you talk. Not at all. And, I, and, and those, those three evils, which I'm going to talk about very briefly. Right. Much like a, a sound uh, uh, theology convicts all of us. Yeah. And when we talk about so many people get brought in and convicted under racism, one of those, those three evils, right? We're called out in that work. And then so many of us are, yeah, we, we join into that, but then King calls out capitalism. And a lot of us who are in school and who seek to gain upward mobility are forced to be convicted about what that means to be successful in a society that is sustained through capitalism. That your success means you standing on other people, right? And then what that means when you feel inspired to go out and, 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 and do change and transform society and disrupt, understand that there is a repressive state apparatus, the military, as we've seen very recently with folks in Ferguson, who will be waiting for you when you choose to disrupt, right? And much of what it means to be successful in this country, much of what it means to have a platform in this country means that we are suppressing the voices of those who are suffering in other parts of the world. And it's been our military and the military force that initially helped to start the mission of colonization and that still keeps to sustain it, right? Really quickly, um, and what that means for us. Years ago, um, I used to teach uh, in Bayview, I used to teach the babies in middle school, and directly across the street, if, we, if you turn, I couldn't teach in my classroom, you turn to your left, there's a funeral home across the street. And every day, our young people saw caskets every day. Our young people saw caskets coming in and out. And it wasn't their elders. It was their cousins, it was their uncles, all under 24, every day. And what we would do is we would keep trying to teach and inspire and teach our young people. And one day I'm teaching and a mother comes out who's burying her son and, she, and, the, and they took the service outside and she just starts crying and wailing. And I kept trying to teach because I had a lesson at hand because the young people needed to go to college, right? The messages that we teach. But her pain, right, was right there and ever so present. And I realized how ridiculous that was to try to carry out a business as usual approach with the suffering right there outside my window, right? And King's work and his legacy reminds us that this is all in void if our work is used to silence those who are suffering, if our work is used to justify why some are suffering and others are successful, and why he died and why so many of us are experiencing the pain that we experience is because our entire country, this country has been established to suppress the voices of the suffering. And his legacy reminds us that we have a calling. We have a calling every day to allow suffering to speak, right? And that, the, that, that justice is about allowing suffering to speak. Man, I'm not going to interrupt you no more, praise God. <laughs> This year is the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Coretta Scott King, her 
his wife and certainly widow brought a lawsuit that was tried in Alabama that found the United States government guilty of conspiring to kill her husband. She didn't ask for money. I think she asked for $1 and an admission of guilt. And, and the Alabama uh, uh, courts um, tried all this evidence and, and, and did that. And, and I think it's important for us to appreciate that in our name, as citizens of the United States, of all of us who are citizens, our tax dollars and our political um, uh, 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 systems are doing things in our name that all of us have to be held accountable for. And so as we follow Jesus faithfully in this country, I can't say what folks in other countries are supposed to do in relationship to their government, but I can say all of us who are here in this country and our tax dollars and our votes and our political leaders are going in a certain direction. May Dr. King's legacy and all of the Freedom Fighters' legacies before us help make sure that we are pushing against the triplets of evil and not acquiescing to them. Make sure that we know the history of the many peoples and lands that have been conquered in the name of uh, imperialism or, or, or American uh, military power or economic power uh, like Haiti and like parts of the Caribbean. Uh, we still got to keep talking about Puerto Rico. We, we still got to keep lifting up all of these these nations, many of whom, dare I say, are majority Christian nations, or at least they have their own self-declaration that they follow Jesus. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. If, if we got to get like parochial about it, praise God. So we have an obligation. Pat yourself on the chest say, I have an obligation. <laughs> on this weekend, let us not make the King holiday a day off when it should remind us we have to have every day on, right? Just like you come to church every week so you don't get amnesia about what God's asking you to do. Oh, bless God. Uh, Martin Luther King's holiday is very important so you don't get amnesia. At least once a year, you're going to be reminded of your call, your responsibility to be very active in this season. How will folks support Haiti, support efforts that you and others are doing to make sure that we uh, do what we can do as a country and as a church and as individuals to repair the historical and current harm that is being done? Sure. So there, there is actually a bill right now that has been proposed. I had to write down the name of it because the acronym is so long. It is the extending status protection for eligible refugees with established residency. The acronym actually is ESPERE, which in Creole means to hope. Um, so it has been brought forward by a Republican um, congressman in Florida um, who obviously has the largest constitu constituency of Haitians in this country. Um, and it only, it's, it's a very limited bill. It only would um, extend status for Haitians, Hondurans, El Salvadorians, a very large group that is also losing their status, and um, Nicaraguans. Mm -hmm. So that's a very small um, number of countries. There are many others, and a lot of the other countries that have temporary protected status, their, their populations are much smaller than these groups. Mm -hmm. But um, I would encourage you to, to follow that bill, to talk to your elected officials and call your, um, rep your US representatives and ask them what they're doing. I do not see a progressive alternative to this bill. I don't know what the Democrats are doing. So <laughs> Don't nobody know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> so there read, are, read that bill one more time just yes. so everybody can, and we'll put it on our Facebook page okay. and tweet it out. Extending status protection for eligible refugees with established residency. Right. Espere. Espere. Let's clap our hands and let's make a commitment to do that. Um, any, final, any final words you, you want to offer? No. 96 hours of resistance is happening here in the Bay Area uh, as we prepare ourselves for the King holiday. I believe we have some of our loved ones here in the congregation. Stand up if you're participating in the 96 hours of resistance, meaning you're going to be out marching tomorrow. Yes, Brother Pat. Um, my brother will be out there. We got a couple other folks. So if you want to go out and, and, and turn up in Jesus' name, wear your, the Wade t-shirts. 
wear your People Against Colonialism t-shirts, uh, wear, I think, the Asian for Black Lives. Um, some of our leaders from that group attend here. They may be already outside in the streets. Find some folks that you know and recognize, and let's do all that we can to be faithful to the holidays. Is that all right, everybody? All right, give God a hand, praise. Thank you so much, my dear loved ones. All right. All right, we're going to prepare to transition real quickly into our time of giving and preaching and et cetera. So let's uh, prepare to do uh, that at this time. Um, if you are um, hanging out with us for the first time, you aren't expected to, to provide money uh, in the offering. If you have something to give, uh, we gladly take it. We want you to know that it will go into the right places to build up a good ministry of, of soul, spirit, and body. But certainly we would love to know that you were here. And so your connection cards that you received when you were coming through uh, would be great and awesome for you to uh, leave with us as well. You that are members of the way, we thank you because your giving has been so fantastic. We are at record levels of giving. Praise God. You ought to clap your hands for that. We're at record levels of giving and stewardship. And we want to go higher. We want to keep going because there are some uh, full-time ministry positions that we want to try to fill in the next several months to make sure that our congregation is being much more responsive to the needs that you all are identifying. And so, amen, just continuing to add, you that have jobs, we all covenant together as members that we will bring 10% of what we earn and bring it to the house of God so we can indeed continue to build a ministry that blesses all of us that are here and certainly those who are in our communities. Um, if you have a young child between the ages of 2 through 11, we do have children's ministry for them. And so as you walk around, you can certainly walk through that door on my left, your right, get them checked in and return to the sanctuary and you'll get a chance to have uh, about a, a good 30 minute or so reprieve as we hear the word of the Lord in the name of Jesus. Let's stand to our feet now then. Again, your connection card, this is a good time to drop that off uh, as you walk around your offering, uh, your gifts, whatever you have. Come on and let's bring it to the Lord. Lift up what you have in your hand. Repeat these words. The blessings of the Lord makes us rich and adds no sorrow. God, we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for blessing us with the kind of blessings that money can't buy. Life, health, strength, victory. You are our sustainer. You are our source. Everything we have, it comes from you. So, God, we bring it now back to you, not as a debt that we owe, but a seed that we sow into the house of God. We ask you to bless every person under the sound of my voice that has the desire to give, but are not able, they can do so at the next time. And we that are bringing to you our tithes, offerings, and donations, keep your word and open up the windows of heaven. Pour us out a blessing we won't have room to receive. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Face the outer wall then as you come. Please walk everyone and don't allow or force anyone to walk over you. Face the outer walls and come from the rear. And let's bring our gifts to God in the name of the Lord. All right, give the Lord a hand, praise everybody. If you're blessed, if you're blessed, if you're blessed, God bless you. Have your seats, have your seats. Again, we have more folks here, so if there is an empty seat, please move to the center. Move to the center of the church, the center aisle. Come on, y'all, help us. Move to the center. Just slide on over. Do the electric slide to the center and make sure there's no empty seats, amen, between you so we can fill these seats. And, and ushers, fill the seats from the outside aisles, please. Fill them from the outside aisles. Thank you so much. Fill them from the outside aisles. Amen. While they're doing that, a couple things. How many of you have uh, had a good first week of consecration? Amen. Amen. Yes. No meats, no sweets for 21 days. Uh, January 7th, we started. And we're going to conclude on January 28th. And we're actually going to have a special baptism service on January 28th to conclude the consecration. So if you'd like to be baptized, you have not been baptized in water, uh, and you would like to uh, experience this very necessary and important practice and sacrament, uh, let us know by 
uh, filling that out on the connection card or letting one of our leaders know, and they'll get you in the in the queue and in the number. But on January 28th, we're going to have a special baptism service during service to help us conclude the consecration in a very powerful way in the name of the Lord. And so we invite all of you to to be mindful that we have two more weeks left. Can you believe you made it through one week without meat and you didn't die? Praise God. I've been eating tofu and uh, is it quinoa? Is that quinoa? Yes. Well, I'm eating it. Y'all know I'm eating it because where else would I know quinoa? Praise God. Wa. Quinoa. Quinoa. Thank you, Wayne. Amen. All us, all us quinoas. Amen. So, so get in on the consecration. It's not too late. Tell your neighbors, not too late. No sweets either. You can't be no sweets, no diabetes juice called soda. Amen. Can't be eating uh, no, 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 no donuts and no, no Twix and Snickers. Amen. No sweets, no meat, no sweets. Uh, get in on the blessing. I think it'll be a great blessing for you. And then uh, Lady Sharice made it into the building today. Thank God. Amen. She's so in love with y'all, amen, and she just wanted to come. So, uh, amen, we just going to thank God that she pressed her way. Amen. I think she certainly wanted to hear Pastor Donna, amen. Not very often she gets to hear good preaching, praise God. So I think she pressed her way in the name of the Lord. Next Saturday, you're teaching new members class. Is that correct? Amen. So The Way 101, if you uh, have not attended The Way 101 uh, and you've joined the church recently, that is next Saturday. You need to sign up. It'll be from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. next Saturday, The Way 101, and uh, you'll get a chance to spend some good quality time hearing the vision and how you plug in to The Way. Again, next Saturday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. All right. She's no stranger to The Way Christian Center. She is uh, an extension of our pastoral staff. Amen. Great to see uh, uh, the whole family here this time. Brother Dedrick, stand on up, D. He's uh, holding it down with little Coltrane in the back. Amen. Uh, so, so glad to have them uh, back in worship and here with us. Uh, Y'all said, can you bring Pastor Donna back more regularly? So I'm just giving the people what they want, praise God. So stand to your feet, everybody, and let us uh, prepare to receive the spokeswoman for the King of Glory. She is Pastor Donna Babb. Amen. <laughs> I give God glory for just being in the house, being around family, being around folk who like, you know, is just safe space, amen? And so I'm so incredibly thankful to God for who God is, but I'm also thankful always to my number two, to Dedrick, who is in the house. You know, usually I travel out and it's just me and, you know, to be able to have Dedrick here is like the bomb diggity because he's the bomb diggity. I know I'm a little biased, but everybody says it, so I'll agree. And of course, always to my brother and sister, to Mike and Sharice, and to all my people here, I'm so incredibly glad to be here. And so this is a joy. Um, it is something that fills my spirit. I love preaching, but to preach here um, it does something special for me. So please know that whatever God allows me to pour out, just being with you is like a refill. So I am thankful for this space. We won't tear it, amen, Miss Darlene is up in the house. Good to see you, Ms. Dali. Um, we're going to get the scripture up um, on um, the screen, and it's going to be coming from John. Yep, thank you, because I don't have my phone up here. John chapter 4. It's, for many of us, it's a familiar passage of scripture. For some of us, maybe not so much. Um, John 4, 3 through 30, and then 39 through 42 reads as follows. He left Judea and started back to Galilee, but he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, 
Ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria. Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. And Jesus answered to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come back. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming. And this is and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah, the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then the disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her jar, water jar and went back to the city and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. Well, one thing, but you know, it felt like everything. <laughs> it was the most, most poignant thing, right? He can can he not can, he cannot be the Messiah can he and they left the city and were on their way to him many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony he told me everything I have ever done so when the Samaritans came to him they asked him to stay with them and he stayed there two days and many more believed because of his word they said to the woman it is no longer because of what you said that we believe for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. Amen. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. We're going to talk a little bit about the danger of a single story. The danger of a single story. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. God, our lives are so complex. They're multifaceted. And despite how people may perceive us or what people may think of us from the outside looking in, most of our lives are extremely full. And so God, our minds are constantly full of thoughts, our bodies filled with emotion as we press and balance and weigh and deal. As we are responsible people, God, we go through our week and then we come to church. And God, sometimes it's very hard to just turn that off. And so, God, we thank you that you don't ask us to leave ourselves at the door, but you ask us to come in with our full selves, that you may attend to us fully. And so, God, we ask in this moment, in this space, that you help us to give ourselves to you in this moment. Lord, that you may open our ears, that we may hear you, and that the words you speak may speak directly to our soul directly to our hearts, directly to our minds and our intellect, directly to the processes of our bodies. God, that we may receive you and your spirit wholly and fully. God, speak, for we are ready to listen, that we may hear, be changed and transformed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So one of my favorite authors is a Nigerian author by the name of Chimamanda Adichie. 
And she did a TED talk entitled The Danger of a Single Story. And the premise of her TED talk was this, that it is very dangerous for anyone to have just a single story about one group of people. So for example, when she came to America to go to college, her American roommate, because she was from Nigeria, expected her to be poor and expected her to be um, able to perform all kinds of ancient tribal practices. Rather, her roommate discovered that she loved Mariah Carey and that she came from an upper middle class Nigerian family that was formally educated. When we have just one story about a group of people, and particularly when that story is not told by them themselves, it can become a very dangerous thing. There's an African proverb that says, until the lion has its own historian, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. The danger of a single story. So those who are in a society who are able to oppress others are those who have power and command of the language, according to psychologist Dr. Naeem Akbar. It is those who have the power to shape the story. Because if you can shape someone's narrative, be it right or wrong, you're able to dictate whether or not they have the value, whether they are worthy enough to receive access to the resources they need. And so today we are going to track the impact of this woman by the well, the impact of her dangerous single story. And perhaps maybe we can see how that impact also shows up in our lives with the dangerous single stories that we are called and or made to live within and abide by. Jesus is leaving Judea and he is on his way to Galilee um, and he must stop in Samaria because he's tired. He stops on the outskirts of the city by Jacob's well and he sits, the disciples go into town to get food. And while Jesus is resting there, a woman approaches the well in the middle of the day. Now for many of us who have heard this story or this account preached over and over again, we may be aware of the fact that it's very odd for her to be showing up at this well in the middle of the day in the heat of the day. Most women would travel to the well either early in the morning or late at night when it's not hot. But the fact that she's showing up in the middle of the day and the fact that there is a geographical, if you look at the geographical landscape of the area, she passed by several sources of water to get to this well. That means that more than likely she is going out of her way to avoid people who would rather not see her, who would rather not encounter her and or avoiding people she would rather not have to deal with. So she approaches this well and she finds Jesus sitting there alone. Jesus is with this woman alone. And so the question becomes why? Like why is it so important that the disciples not be there? Why is it so important that nobody else from the city be there? It's just Jesus and this woman. And so I had to ask the question, could Jesus have been creating safe space for this woman to encounter him? Because he knew that in order for her to receive any kind of thing from him, she didn't need the prying and judging eyes of the people who had created a single story about her. That so much that it dictated her behavior and created an inconvenience in her daily life. Could Jesus have been creating safe space, even from the disciples? Yeesh. I currently serve at a small liberal arts college in Raleigh, North Carolina. And when I first came there, um, even up until this point, I would say that my most difficult um, time that I've had serving there is that when I first came there, I had not served a predominantly white space in 11 years. And so I had underestimated how I would feel in this space. And so as the chaplain, as the spiritual leader of a college, right, of many different people from many different backgrounds, um, they do still have a service on Wednesday that is usually worship, not always worship. And I can recall, um, about two or three months in, right, 
um, there was a shooting, Philando Castile was, was killed. And I was feeling some kind of way because it was on a Wednesday, the next day was a Wednesday, and I had to lead worship at this school. And I can remember crying <laughs> as Dedrick drove me into the city. I had processed with Dedrick. I was like, baby, I don't know. Like, I don't see how I'm going to make it through the service without naming my grief. Like, I can't make it through the service without saying how this is impacting me. You know, but I'm fairly new to the space, and most of the people don't look like me. And so when I got to, to work, I cried some more, you know, and I prayed some more. And so I called my girls, both of whom are pastors, who kind of cover me. I said, look, y'all got to pray for a sister because, you know, I'm, I'm either going to lose my job <laughs> or folk going to be calling for me to lose my job. And so I knew that I could not go into that worship service and not name it. So when it came time for the service, I looked up. And one of my girls that I had called was walking down the aisle, Shalise Overy, came and sat herself right down there, and I got a little courage, right? Got a little hope. I'm like, all right, Jesus, you showing up, you showing up. <laughs> and so the time came for the passing of the peace, the meet and greet, right? Touch your neighbor type of thing. And when everybody kind of settled down, I said, look, I... I'm torn this morning. And I said, the reason I'm torn is because I have been taught very two clear but very real things as a black woman in this country. I said, one, I was taught that the faith community is the place that we bring our grief and it can be held collectively by the community. And I said, and I've lived by that, right? I've survived by that. I said, but I was also taught as a black woman that you don't share your racial experiences in mixed company because you never know when it's not going to be safe. I said, so I am torn. And I'm living in this tension right now, I said, because I am grieving over something that is specifically connected to my race. I said, and I am in the faith community. I said, but I am in what has historically been considered mixed company. I said, so here's what I'm going to do. I said, I'm going to rely on the grace of God and hope that this community is able to at least hear my grief. I said, why? I said, because as your chaplain, I want you to know that your grief is always welcome. And I can't expect you to know that if I am unwilling to bring mine and place it here, right? And so I began to share, right? I began to share, and as I began to share, tears began to form. I thought I had cried, and you know, that's a faux pas for a black, strong black woman. I was like, doggone it. Why I got to cry, you know? <laughs> I'm trying to control the situation, you know, then laid out all these great words I'm going to say, and I'm just crying, right? And then afterward, I said, look, I'm not expecting you to understand. I said, all I'm asking you to do is acknowledge my grief and my experience. So some people were, in fact, grossly uncomfortable with that, never came back to chapel. I still love them. They still call me if they need prayer, which is a good sign. But an overwhelming majority of the people embraced me before I left. And they didn't really have a lot to say, they just hugged me. And that was all that was necessary. But as I was reflecting, right, on this whole scenario, what I realized is that I had unconsciously began to believe that God was an insufficient arc of safety for me in spaces where I felt unsafe. That my dangerous single story that I was living inside of had made me believe that God was not enough. Hear me when I say, Jesus created safe space for this woman by the well in a very taboo way. He was a man, a Jewish man, alone with a woman with a questionable reputation. Why? Because her experience and his encounter with her was more important than any story anybody had written for her. God is sufficient for our safety, even when we are experiencing pain. Wherever God is, there is home. And where is God? Every dog on where, everywhere. God, in that moment, created safety for her. 
So she approaches this well, and there is this Jewish man sitting there. Y'all, Jews didn't like Samaritans. They just didn't like them, right? And so can you imagine all the things that are running through her head, right? Her heart might be beating a little faster, right? Like this could be a very scary moment for her. She usually comes to this well. There's no one there. And not only is there a man there, but there's a man who is known to be of a group of people who hate people like her. And then this man has the audacity to ask her for something. Hey, can you give me a drink? Right? Now think about all of the things that are running through her mind in this moment that could be potentially all at once, right? Like, why is he here? Does he really just want a drink? And if I give him a drink and don't say anything, like, what will he imply that to me? Right? Like, how do I get out of this? Like, how can I respond to him in a way that I know that he knows I'm not available without making him volatile? Because I'm out here and isolated by myself, and I don't know this dude. And all of these things could have been running through her head all at once, but she responds almost immediately in the moment. Why is it that you, y'all see the attitude? A Jew. (laughs) Think it's cool for you to ask me a female Samaritan, for a drink of water. Do you hear her hesitation, her skepticism, right? Her dangerous single story had created an environment where her hesitation was like key to her survival. Like she didn't have the privilege of not being skeptical. She didn't have the privilege of not hesitating because in any given moment, her physical, emotional, spiritual health was negotiable. Here she was in the presence of the one who could give her everything she needed and she had to hesitate. She was skeptical. So I served another college campus about a decade ago yeah, it was about a decade ago. I'm getting a little old. And um, me and a dean on the campus and another administrative assistant were walking across the campus, and a student approached the dean who was in his class and was talking about how he didn't have a book and oh, how he needed a book, and he needed an extension on his um, assignment because he didn't have a book. And so the administrative assistant who was there with us asked him, he said, well, is it possible for you to share a book with someone? And the guy got really rude with her, and he was like, no. Like, you know, why are you talking to me type of thing. And so he goes on trying to pitch his, you know, stuff some more. And then finally the administrative assistant says, well, I might can help. What was your name again? Was it Oscar? And he said, no, my name ain't Oscar. Your name is Piggy. And at first, you know, I'm sitting there watching this thinking like, what? What? Did- Miss Piggy, like, where did that come from? And then I realized, oh, you thought she was calling you Oscar the Grouch, which was actually quite fitting. And so she looked at him and she was like, wow, really? And she turns and she walks away. And the dean looks at this student and he says, you know, he says, she was probably the one person that could have given you a book. She had several in her office and she probably was just wanting to clarify your name so she could put one aside for you. This brother was so incredibly angry in his person, maybe for good reason. I'm not saying it wasn't with good reason. But he was so incredibly angry in his person that he repelled the very thing he needed. Like when we live inside this dangerous single story that anyone has written for us, the confines of it, the boundaries of it, it makes it hard for us to recognize water when we're thirsty. It makes it hard for us to recognize food when we're hungry, rest when we're weary, God when we need life. What she needed was right there. But because of what she had been designed and pushed into by design and by intention, her whole survival mechanism was based upon hesitating and questioning and being skeptical. And so Jesus responds to her skepticism by setting himself apart. He says, if you knew the gift of life that God gives, if you knew who it was you were talking to, right? He says, you, in essence, would be asking me for some water. 
right? You'll be asking me to give you what it is that you need. You'll be asking me to give you living water. And she says, how you gonna give me some water? You ain't got no bucket, <laughs> right? This is sister showing up, y'all. <laughs> like, you ain't got no bucket? What can you do for me? <laughs> you don't give me some water? <laughs> and Jesus is like, no, the water that I will give is living water. Like, those who drink of the water that I give will never thirst again, yeah. right? Because it will be like a wellspring of eternal life in them, right? Like, welling up and just expanding and growing and flowing, right? And she's like, what? Holla, give me some of this water. It's hot. I ain't coming out here no more. Yes, I want some of that, right? Sign me up. And then Jesus asked her a very strange question, like out of the blue. Jesus asked about her husband. And she was like, I ain't got no husband. She was like, you're right. You ain't got no husband. You've had five. And the one you're with now isn't your husband. She was like, what? Oh, my Lord, you a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> now here's the interesting thing y'all because you know I grew up in the Baptist church I'm ordained in the Baptist church right classic Baptist preacher from the south and I have heard this passage preached so many times around confronting your sin but at what point do you ever hear Jesus mention sin in this passage And how many times, if you go back and read the gospel, has Jesus interacted with somebody and then said to them, go and sin no more? But he doesn't say that to her. Jesus, like, names this thing, and once she acknowledges him as a prophet, he don't say nothing else about it. Could it be? Just consider. Could it be that Jesus was not just telling her this to convince her of who he was, but that Jesus wanted her to know that he knew her story? What if this was Jesus saying, I see you, I know you? What if this was Jesus saying, I know the circumstances that you've been in, that society has put you in, that made you make the choices you had to make just to survive? You see, this is what a lot of people don't get about Jesus. This is what we don't hear a lot about Jesus. You see, Jesus wasn't just a person who went to the margins, right? Jesus was born to the margins, and then Jesus grew up yeah. in the margins. How do we know? We just came out of Advent, did we not? And what did they say? Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem, right? And when they got there, there was what? No room. People for whom society has no room are people who are in the margins. She had her brown baby in a barn, y'all. Yeah. Jesus was born in the margins. And then where does Jesus grow up? Nazareth. And what does Nathaniel say? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Jesus saw her. He saw her. What other people say is your sin. What other people create shame around. I know you're doing that because they have denied you access to what you need to just live. I know your story. So then they have this conversation about worship. And then she says, well, I believe the Messiah is coming. And then Jesus says, I am he. So right here on the outskirts of Samaria, out here by Jacob's well, Jesus encounters this woman who's been judged, encounters this woman who's been confined by this dangerous single story, encounters this woman who has seen so many injustices. People have made her to feel as if she is nothing, literally, so much so that she has to travel during the hottest part of the day just to get water to drink. And he gives her a proclamation of the highest order. He was saying in that moment, not only do I see you, not only do I get you and understand you and know you, but you matter enough for me to entrust this proclamation 
with you. I'm giving you something that nobody else in that city will know. He gave her the proclamation that the Messiah has come. He was saying, you matter. All of a sudden, her single story was dynamic and multifaceted and organic. A couple of years ago, <clears throat> I co-preached a sermon on race with a good friend of mine who's a white pastor in Durham, North Carolina. She pastors a predominantly white church that is very wealthy. And in that sermon, she gives a story or an example of an experience that she had serving at a different church where the minister of music there was one of the only black people in the church. And she said she realized that she had served there for about five years and it never asked him what his experience had been like. And so when she ran into him a couple of years later, she asked him, she said, what? I never asked you, what was your experience like serving in this community? He says, well, overall it was good, you know? He was like, but I will say, the hardest moment came on the morning that Trayvon Martin's verdict was read. And he said, I came to church he said, not only was it not mentioned, he said, but y'all had a blessing of the animals. He says, and that was the first time I was in that community that I felt like my experiences, my pain, my life didn't matter any more than the dead bodies lying in the street. Jesus was saying to this woman, you matter. You matter. She places her water pot on the side of the well as the disciples come back, right? Thinking all this crazy stuff in their head. There's a reason why we found out what they were thinking in their head, right? At least they had the good sense not to say nothing to Jesus about it. <laughs> they would have been embarrassed, right? She puts her water jar down and she runs into town to the very people who have created and literally promoted this story that dictated the quality of her life. And she is so excited. And she says, come and see a man. Come and see a man who told me everything. Notice, Jesus said what? One thing about her life. But she knew that he knew it all. He told me everything. Everything about my life, everything I've ever done, could he be the Messiah? And people began to leave the confines of their safe and comfortable homes. They began to track that same road that she had to travel each and every day through the hot sun. They have to follow the same path to salvation that she had to follow. They had to follow the same path in the heat of the day that her story that they had created for her had dictated. We talk about justice. You see, normally we are used to Jesus meeting us where we are. And there's truth to that. But this time, Jesus didn't come into the city. Jesus said, if you want to get to me, doggone it, you're going to have to walk the same path that you have made this woman walk every single day every day you're gonna have to come to the margin you got to come to me doggone it and so they get there with jesus and jesus is talking and teaching and loving and they ask jesus to stay and they say he said yeah i'll stay for two days and then after those two days are up jesus has offered to them the same story, the same narrative, the same dangerous single story that he offered to this woman, his story. But you see, the difference is, in order for them to embrace Jesus' dangerous single story that includes everybody, even the woman that they had oppressed, they had to release the one that they were holding, which I believe proved to be very difficult. I believe we see in 42, why this is so difficult. Now we have read verse 42 over and over and over again, right? And it's, it's the part where they come to her and they say, hey, we don't believe no more because of what you said. We've seen for ourselves, right? We know that this is the Messiah, this is the Christ. And I've always read that passage to believe that we often come to Christ because of the testimony of others, but we stay with Christ 
because of our own experience. And again, there is truth to that, right? But in preparing for this sermon, I had to read that passage differently. Why did they feel the need to say that to her? Why did they feel the need to turn to her and say, we don't believe because of what you said, no more? Like, what was the purpose? Like, were they really trying to re-tip the scales of power? Jesus had used a woman that they felt was beneath them to give them access to something they needed. Could it be that they didn't like it? And you see, this is a big piece, y'all. Because you see, when we move from the dangerous single story that society creates for us to the liberation of the dangerous single story that Jesus writes because everybody is included without exception, that means right? That those powers at B that want to claim superiority based upon social structure will not like the dangerous single story that we walk by because we're now free. But there's another small piece to this. These were the people who were there saying, no, we believe Jesus' story. We want to be free, right? They want to embrace Jesus' story, but I think that this is a very clear reminder for us that everyone who believes Jesus' story has not made the commitment to live it out. That sometimes there is a tension that still exists within them that makes them fight against it. They want to embrace Christ, but they also want to keep their superiority. And I think that's what we see. I think we see that in verse 42, them bucking against it. We don't believe because of you no more. We know for ourselves. Here's why this is important for us, y'all. Because when we embrace our true story, right, our story of liberation, it does not exempt us from re-traumatization. We see in this passage that Jesus and giving her a new dangerous single story, literally ties her to the very people who had caused her pain. He bound her to them, right? She has to stay in this city as a witness. She has to re-emerge into that culture and live in that culture. But here's what she has to do, what I believe she has to do in order to maintain her sanity, right? She does need to go in and be a witness to all the people who need to know about liberation. But every once in a while, she's going to need to make that track back out to that well in order to be refilled, in order to not give up hope, right? In order to be replenished. There has to be this back and forth, this ebb and flow of engaging and disengaging, right? Of going in and taking a rest. And if you don't have that balance, right, you're going to either stay at the well too long and not get anything done. The world just continues. Or you're going to stay in the city too long and you're going to lose hope. And you're going to forget that there is a savior. So if there's too much of either one, God's story, our story, the the dangerous single story of liberation doesn't get told. It doesn't get lived out, y'all. And that would be a shame. You know why? Because that's the point of all of this. Amen? In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the blessed Holy Ghost. Amen. Come on, stay standing. Grab the hand of someone next to you. Let's respond to this sermon. She got it. Respond to this sermon by asking God about the single stories you're carrying around, about yourself, about your circumstance, your journey, about the person that is next to you or in your family that continues to be a growing edge for you. Ask God to help you interrogate this single story so you don't have to continue to live bound by the inadequacy of that single story to hold you or to awaken 
the parts of you that God needs alive. Come on and interrogate that single story and invite the Lord to come in and disrupt that because healing is within your grasp. Salvation is within your grasp. Wholeness is within your grasp. Invite the Spirit in right now. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. This is my story. This is my story. This is my song. This is my song. Praising my Savior. Praising my Savior. Praise Him all the day long. This is my story. This is my story. This is my song. This is my song. Praising my Savior. Praising my Savior. All the day long. Father, I pray that you'll bless the hands that I'm touching right now. I pray, God, that you will allow whatever that is happening in their heart and in their mind right now in response to this powerful message. I pray, God, that it will not be a fleeting, passing impulse, but I pray it will sit right down at the root of their story i pray that they will identify that they are at the well with jesus right now and jesus is interrogating that single story remind them that lord they are not the worst thing that that has ever happened to them in their life remind them that they are more than anyone's description remind them that before they were formed in their mother's womb you knew them and you created them to be a tool in your hand, a testimony, a story, a powerful expression of your love. So bless my loved one who I'm touching. Squeeze their hand gently. Lord, I squeeze into their hands peace and power and healing. Lord God, I squeeze into their hand hope and restoration. I squeeze into their hands salvation from all that has harmed them, has oppressed them, has separated them from right relationship with you and with one another. God, we declare and decree today is the day of victory and liberation. Now lift your hands right where you stand. It's me, oh Lord, and I'm standing in the need of prayer. It is not my mother, it is not my father. It is not my sister, nor is it my brother, but it is me, oh Lord, and I need you. I need your love. I need your power. I need your strength. I need you, God, to sustain me and hold me in this season. I need you to save my soul from destruction. I need you to heal my mind and, and deliver me, Lord God, from the wiles and the strategies of the enemy. I need you to restore the brokenness of my heart, Lord God, and ease the trouble that is in my mind. I need you, God. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. Say it again. I need you, Lord. Lord God, come and visit and see about me right now. In Jesus' name we pray. If you're not saved today and you want to make a decision to follow Jesus, come on and just lift your hands real high and say, Lord, I want to follow you today. I want to confess with my mouth. I want to believe in my heart that you've raised Jesus from the dead. And Lord, I want to give my life to you. Come on and make that confession. Make that decision. And if that's you, come and stand with us right here at the altar. You may be here today. You just need to touch and agree with someone about this dangerous single story. You need God to just remind you that there's more to you. There's more to you than what others say and what others define. This is a powerful opportunity during the consecration, during the first month of the year, 
to make sure this year is not a single story definition. You need prayer. Come out of your seat and meet us here at the altar. And let's pray and let's seek the face of God together just for a few moments. Come on, everyone, let's join. This is my story. This is my story. This is my song. This is my song. Praising my Savior. Praising my Savior. Come on, if you need prayer, if you need someone to touch and agree with you today, for your circumstance to change, for your condition to be healed, for your story to be nuanced and described in its fullness. If you need salvation, if you need healing, this is a good time to come. Come and receive prayer. Come and receive the touch of the Lord today. Praising my Savior all the day long. Say this is, it's my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Praising my Savior all day long. This is my this is my song. This is my song. This is my song. Praising my praising my Savior all the day long. This is my song. I'm praising, praising my, my Savior all the day long. This is, this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Come on, this is this is my story. Come on, this, is my this is my song. Come on, testify to his goodness. Praise my Savior, my Savior all the day long. long. This is my, this is my story. And this is my this song. This is my song. Lord, I promise to praise you. my Savior. All the day long. Come on, lift up your story in the atmosphere. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. Praising my Savior. All the day long. This is my story. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. So God, we want to say Savior, all that you day will be glorified. Long. Praising my Savior. Praising my Savior all the day long. All the day long. We give you glory, God. We praise Praising my Savior all the day long. Praising my Savior all the day long. We're praising my Savior, say, praising my Savior all the day long. Come on, stretch your right hand towards Pastor Donna. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, what a gift she is to your kingdom. Thank you, Lord God, for all the many ways that you remind us of your great love and plan you have for us. I pray that you will continue, God, to speak through her in ways that bless this generation. Lord God, bless her, Lord God, bless her family, bless, Lord God, this new baby that is on the way, God. Lord, just sustain her like you always have. God, and keep bringing her back to us. Lord God, in sweet fellowship and partnership, her and Dedrick and the children make all things well in their life and refill and replenish all that she's poured out to us. Refill her some 10 and a hundredfold. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, let's clap our hands and let's thank God. Let's thank God. Hallelujah. Come on, let's thank the Lord. Let's thank the Lord. Listen, I don't do this often, amen, but I just want to take an offering and bless Pastor Donna. Y'all want to bless her today? Is that all right? Everything you give will go straight to Pastor Donna and her family. Amen. They, they flew all the way. And we certainly flew them here. We put them up. So there's, you know, their expenses are already paid. But I do want to be a blessing to Pastor Donna because I, I want to bring her back at least once a quarter. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So come on, just get whatever you have, whatever's loose in your hands, $5, $1, $10, $100. Just get something. I'm going to ask our, our deacons to come real quick, real quick. Amen. And just from all over the building, just come and let's just be a blessing. Let's just be a blessing. Amen. Let's just be a blessing. You don't have to wait for anybody to walk. Just come and just drop something in and let's just bless the battle family. Amen. Let's just be a blessing to them. They've been a blessing. Y'all know a few members of the way, this is probably the first time we've done a second offering in the history of our church. Amen. Amen. But we're going to be a blessing to Pastor Donna today. Amen. We're going to be a blessing to her and her family because that message, amen, was just something of a great blessing it's not by force so it's it's no shame or nothing we just so somebody's blessing her for you amen so you ought to just be clapping your hands for everybody that's being a blessing for you to the battle family amen come on keep clapping that's the least we can do we're thankful for all the blessings that are coming to the battle family by our church we love the battle family they're a wonderful family, wonderful gifts to us. Wonderful gifts to us, wonderful gifts, wonderful gifts, wonderful gifts. We thank God for them. We thank God for their great service and their great ministry to us. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, keep clapping. There's a few more coming. Come on, keep clapping, keep clapping. We thank the Lord. We thank the Lord, we thank the Lord, we thank the Lord, we thank the Lord. Yes, 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 yes. God bless you today. God bless you in the name of the Lord. All right, we're getting ready to dismiss, and we want to thank God for all of you that have been here. If you are uh, visiting us for the first time and you don't have a church home, and you'd like to join the Way Church today, you'd like to make it official that you are a member of the Way, come on out of your seat and meet us right here at the front. Amen. It's a good time to join because the Way 101 is this Saturday, so you can just jump right on in. Jump right on in. Walk to the front, then slide to Saturday. Is there anybody that wants to come and join the way today? Wants to come? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Come on, stand up right here. He told me, I've been waiting, bruh. Amen. Anyone else? Anyone else want to come? Want to come and join? Amen. The way church today. God bless you. God bless you. All right. Well, come on. Let's anoint this wonderful, wonderful gift. Amen. And We're going to have them introduce themselves. Yes, my name is Al Hutchinson, and I uh, knew, just moved out to uh, California, living over in Pleasant Hill. Just moved out uh, right before Christmas. So glad to be here. Thank you. My name is uh, Teresa Gonzalez. Um, I've been in the Bay Area for just a little bit over a year now. Um, came out here for work, and I am originally from New Mexico. All right, stretch your right hand forward, everyone. These are some spirit-filled justice warriors, amen. And so they just jumping on in, and we thank God. Let's pray a special prayer of covering. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the gift, Lord God, that you have given to us through these wonderful, wonderful loved ones. We ask you to bless them, Lord God. Bless them as they continue to make their uh, 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 move and, and get acclimated to our community and to this region. I pray, God, that you will continue to give them all that they need, Lord God, in this season of their life. I pray that the spirit of the Lord that is already at work in them will continue to manifest in powerful ways. I pray, God, that you will give them all of the blessings that only come from you. I pray that you will close every door that must be closed, open every door that must be opened, and give them only victory and power and no defeat. This is our prayer in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Bless you. 
All right, we love everybody with the love of the Lord. We're getting ready to let everyone go. This Wednesday, we do have Bible study at 6.30. Everybody say 6.30. 6.30, we have Bible study. We're going to go over the sermon, keep diving into our consecration lessons. And uh, certainly, if you are not able to join us physically, but we all want you here. If you're not able to join us physically, we are streaming the classes online. So wherever you are, hop on Facebook Live and let's all spend a midweek uh, time of study as a community together in the name of the Lord. Is that all right, everybody? All right, pray, amen, for me and my family, amen. We're all, uh, I'm going to be heading out for a little bit, uh, for about a week or so uh, to get a little bit of recharge. Uh, pray for Lady Sharice, amen, and she she continues to feel better, amen, and and uh, pray for our family, and we'll certainly pray for you in the name of the Lord, and uh, we anticipate Cree 18, amen, to be a quite of a year. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Wayne is coming to pray us out. Anybody feeling like I'm feeling like that? Like, man, my, my, my. I, I don't really know how to explain what I'm feeling. I'm, I'm going to pray us out. Um, Heavenly Father, we first and foremost just come thanking you for this amazing vessel that you allowed us to experience today. Dr. Donna blessed us, Lord. So we ask you to use the word that she sent forth about the woman at the well and let it be transformative in our lives, Lord. We come praying that you continue to keep our brothers and our sisters who are being directly impacted by policies and laws um, that are being pushed by this new administration, Lord. Keep them covered, Lord. We know that you have the last word, Lord. So have your way with all of these policies and all of these laws and all of the situations, Lord. Continue to use us to be light in this darkness, you, oh Lord. Continue to endow us with your Holy Spirit so nobody will feel hopeless or helpless, Lord. We ask you to do all of this in the mighty name and the most magnificent name we know, and that name is Jesus. In Jesus' name and in Jesus' name and in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen.